Our movement and the Republican Party are not the same. But for many of us, the Republican Party is the vehicle that we've chosen to accomplish our political and policy goals. And therefore, the way that party operates and the way it looks at the world is important to us because without it, we don't have a viable vehicle at this point in our history. So the chairmanship of the Republican National Committee is important. The candidates that the party selects are important. And the way we work with them is important. I want to talk today both about that party and our movement, because in some ways we face the same kinds of problems. You know, I've been around for a while, uh, and it's interesting because parties and movements are themselves interesting. The Republican Party has been left for dead many times over the course of the last few decades and always seems to come back. But what's more interesting to me is the way that party establishments, and indeed the establishments of movements, react when new people come in. In 1964, the first presidential campaign that I was really active in, Barry Goldwater and a whole new generation of people challenged the establishment of the Republican Party. They were dismissed as crazy. They were they, the establishment tried to keep them out, but they came in anyway. And as a result, they changed the Republican Party and made it the vehicle that at least was available to conservatives for policy and political reasons. By the early 1970s, I was working in the White House, and during the Nixon administration, there was an attempt to launch something we called Operation Switch, was to get Democrats who had been left behind by a Democratic Party moving rapidly to the left to join the Republican Party. And that, that project focused on election, on elected officials at the state and local level in the South. And I remember a member of Congress coming to me and literally screaming at me at the top of his lungs. He said, we don't want those people in our party. If they come into our party, do you know what's going to happen? They're going to want to have something to say about how we run the party. They're going to primary us. They came in anyway. They changed the Republican Party. They became part of a new establishment. And that congressman's prophecy may have been correct because a few years later he was defeated in a statewide primary by a former Democrat. Then came the Reagan Revolution of 1976 when, the, when Ronald Reagan challenged the now new but old Republican establishment headed by then President Ford. I was involved in that and I remember talking to a member of the Republican National Committee, a good conservative who'd been a friend of mine, was a friend of mine, and I said, there's not much I can do because we're going to have to roll over all of you. And he said, how do you think I got here? He said, I came in with the Goldwater people in 1964. What took everybody so long? Because we need new people and we have to accept the fact that when new people come in, they want a voice. The Reagan people came in and today, many of them are part of the party establishment. The party establishments always seem to act, the new ones eventually seem to act like the old ones. Remember Pat Robertson? When he ran for president, evangelicals began to stream into the party, and who can forget the Michigan National Committeeman who said that a meeting of Robertson supporters resembled nothing so much as the bar scene in Star Wars. <laughs> party leaders said, we don't want those people in our party. They came anyway. They came anyway, and many of them today are part of the new old Republican establishment. In the last cycle, we had young libertarian students backing an improbable presidential candidate from Texas. Fully 50% of all the votes cast in all the Republican presidential primary states in the last cycle by people 30 and under were cast for Ron Paul. And yet, and yet, the party establishment said, let's not get too close to these people. We don't really want them. Party establishments tend to want voters. They just don't want them in their clubs. They don't want them participating in the decision making. And so this year, this year, Rand Paul 
becomes a hero to grassroots Republicans across the country and an aging former presidential candidate of the old establishment tells the press we don't want people like him because he appeals to young people. Well, let me tell you something. Political movements and political parties have two choices in this world. They grow or they die. They bring people in or they drive people out. The strength of our movement from the very beginning has been that it's been a movement based upon ideals and principles. And from the beginning, from the very beginning, we've attracted anyone who repaired to the banner that we represent. And if we ever stop doing that, we won't deserve to grow. We won't deserve as a political movement to remain viable. And if the Republican Party adopts exclusionist policies, it won't win, it won't succeed, and it, like movements and parties in the past, will be looking back at its glory days. Fortunately, many, many Republicans and most conservatives recognize this need. But I'd like to go back a little bit. This is our 40th Conservative Political Action Conference. And uh, several speakers today have talked about the fact that our first conference, there were maybe 125 people. They, seemed, they came to see this guy, Ronald Reagan. And they, it was a family gathering. And for some years it went on that way, but each year a few more people came in. Ronald Reagan at that time was the heir to Barry Goldwater. The modern conservative movement, however, didn't begin with either Ronald Reagan or Barry Goldwater. It began, as most successful movements do, not as a product of political or community organizers, but of writers, intellectuals, and thinkers. Its early stars and leaders were not Goldwater and Reagan, but people like William F. Buckley, Jr., who after assaulting those who no doubt considered themselves his better, betters at Yale, went on in 1955 to found the National Review. Russell Kirk, who wrote the seminal Conservative Mind and found a congenial publisher in Chicago of all places in the person of Henry Regnery. Milton Friedman, George Stigler, Frederick Hayek, all of whom hung out in Chicago and challenged the economics of the day and eventually helped us turn the world upside down. Some years ago I talked to Daniel Jurgen, the author of Commanding Heights, a work in which he points out that the 50s marked the triumph of collectivism the world over. It was the era of the five-year plan, government enterprise, and a faith in the wisdom of the state that dominated thinking not just in the Soviet Union and the socialist countries of Scandinavia, in Britain as well, and yes, even in the United States. Those were dark days for believers in economic and political liberty the world over. Remember when Whitaker Chambers abandoned communism, he felt certain that he was abandoning the winning for the losing side. Chambers' assessment proved wrong in large measure because of the work of the intellectuals, the writers, and the publishers who were thinking, writing, and beginning to proselytize even as he penned those words. Jürgen points out that even as the forces of collectivism seemed dominant, a small but growing band of intellectuals and writers were planting the seeds that would eventually produce the modern conservative movement. Shortly after World War II, the Reader's Digest had published Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom. In his book, Jürgen calls that the most important decision, publishing decision of the post-war era, because that one little book sparked a movement of ideas that changed the world. It wasn't long before Hayek, Friedman, and others joined to launch two groups that Jürgen hadn't even heard of until he began researching his book, but which aided in the revolution to come. They were the Mount Paleron Society and the Philadelphia Society, societies that brought together people who believe 
in free markets and free men. By the early 60s, even as liberal establishment figures of the day were scoffing at the very idea of an American conservative movement, believers in liberty and capitalism were organizing, reading, and learning, and some of them were beginning to think that just maybe the ideas of those they so admired might be molded into a political movement. Within the Republican Party, a revolt began to smolder after the 1952 nomination fight that, considered, that pitted the conservative Robert Taft of Ohio against the man credited with winning the Second World War, Dwight David Eisenhower. Eisenhower won that political battle as well, of course. But it energized men and women who would figure in the development of the new movement. Chief among them, a housewife from Alton, Illinois, who was here with us this weekend, named Phyllis Schlafly. In 1960, the Young Americans for Freedom formed at Bill Buckley's home in Sharon, Connecticut. Stan Evans, who was with us this weekend and received an award the other evening, and as a former chairman of the American Conservative Union, authored the Sharon Statement at that organizing meeting of Young, Young Americans for Freedom, a statement which to this day stands as the best and most concise statement of conservative values written in the modern time. The movement was growing. At that year's convention, there was an attempt to nominate Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater for vice president. This was 1960. Goldwater was the new conservative hero. He had written a conservative political manifesto called Conscience of a Conservative, and like some young senators today, had the courage to stand up on the Senate floor and say what he believed. He became a hero to the right when he described the domestic pro program of the Eisenhower establishment as nothing more than a dime store New Deal. Goldwater withdrew his name that year, but delivered a speech in which he challenged conservatives to grow up, seize the Republican Party, and turn it into a vehicle for conservative victory. Four years later, at San Francisco's Cow Palace, Palace, they did just that by nominating Goldwater himself after vanquishing the New York governor, Nelson Rockefeller, who was then the icon of the old Republican establishment. Goldwater lost that election, but his candidacy changed American politics. If the Eisenhower election produced Phyllis Schlafly, the Goldwater campaign produced Ronald Reagan. And while it's tempting to say that the rest is history, the conservative political successes that followed produced a better world but created new problems with which a new generation of conservatives must contend today. Ronald Reagan brought an optimism to the conservative political movement born both of his own amiability but more importantly from his deep belief that the values that motivated him and us were not only worth fighting for but were true. He knew that we're right and they're wrong. That's something most politicians don't know when they get up to deliver a policy speech. Ronald Reagan knew. He knew that our ideas work and that theirs don't. That was and remains today a solid reason for optimism. He also had great faith in the common sense and wisdom of the average American. He proved time and time again that if you're willing to frame your ideas well and communicate them effectively, they will gain the public support they deserve. No one sense has done quite as well, but the course he charted for us is one sure path to victory in the political arena and in the fight for policies that will make this country as great as we see it. After every political defeat, candidates, strategists, consultants, party chairmen, activists sit down and search for a path back. And there are always those among them who say that, you know, we lost because of our ideas and values and what we really ought to do is change them. I remember some years ago, Bill Kristol wrote that the only reason to be in politics was to gain and hold power. Wrong. That's not the reason we're involved in political activity. We're involved in the political arena because of the ideas and the values we share. We're involved because we know we're right and they're wrong.
The pure politician, interested only in gaining, holding, and exercising power, has the freedom to say, well, if these values aren't selling, why don't we just change them? Because I don't care that much anyway. We don't have that luxury, but we do know deep down, as Ronald Reagan did, that we don't have to change them. Because again, we know that we're right and they're wrong. What we need to do, and this is our job, if we believe in our values and in the democratic process in which we operate, what we need to do is look at how effectively we're communicating those values and how we can get our views, our vision, our values, our policies before those who aren't as obsessed with politics as we are, but have the common sense to make the right choice when they have access to the information they need to make that choice. Successful political movements begin, as Jürgen pointed out, as intellectual movements, but they achieve electoral success when the ideas developed by the intellectuals and writers are made attractive to their fellow citizens by political leaders who can communicate effectively and organize for political victory. Our critics are in power today, but what they're trying to do won't work in this country. It hasn't worked anywhere else, anytime, and it's not going to work this time. That's why a speaker earlier this week said, I think we've got them right where we want them. Because try as they might, they're going to fail. They thought they had the world in their grasp in the 50s, and they think they've got it again today. But even the least political of our fellow citizens will eventually grasp that they are on a road that is going to lead somewhere that none of us want to go. Our job is to hasten that realization, to show them a better way, and gather them in as disillusionment mounts. We conservatives have done it before, and believe me, we can do it again. Ours is a vibrant movement, a coalition of men and women who value their freedom, understand the importance of the institutions that guarantee it, and will never give up in the struggle to achieve the free and prosperous society we know that vision will produce. We conservatives have our differences, we always have. We're a fractious bunch. I used to say that when the movement began and three of us got together in a room, there was bound to be an argument. We don't and we never have marched in lockstep and we never will. It would be boring if we did. But together we've prevailed in the past and we will in the future. We've done so in the past by applying our principles to the ever-changing issues political leaders face in a dynamic and free society. We've succeeded not by gathering in a dark corner to denounce the state of the world, but by recruiting and welcoming those who will stand with us. A party or movement, as I said at the beginning, that can do that will survive, grow, and win. One that does not will be pushed aside by one that does. That's why over the years, this conference and those who attend it have welcomed young people and others willing to join in the effort to build a better world. It's, we it's why we strive not to change our values, but to spread their appeal. And it's why we recognize that most of those who oppose us today may turn out to be allies tomorrow when they figure out that the road they're on is taking them nowhere. We know, as Ronald Reagan did, that we're right, they're wrong, that our ideas work and theirs don't. And that freedom is always a better alternative to slavery. And that we want everyone who shares our values as a part of a growing and vibrant conservative movement. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being part of this conference and thank you for what you do every day. Thank you.